Bless your word to our hearts. Now we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Hey, welcome back, Mary. She's been in Quebec. Quebec for a long time. Can you hear me back there, Mary? No. Well, no? Okay. Okay, well, I can talk louder or you can hear louder. All right, I want to share with you today, um, darkest, the, the darkness is finest the hour. And as, as I, I'm going to start with the story. Um, on, April, on April day in 1912, the famed Titanic sped toward the north to New York on its ill-fated maiden, maiden voyage. Over 1,500 people perished when the Titanic hit an iceberg and the ship's sealed chambers were ripped open. Many fascinating human interest stories emerged from that tragedy. And then a few years ago, they went down and saw it and everything. Uh, so it's been quite interesting. One story that is deeply impressed is that, that of a little known man named Colonel Gracie. Colonel Gracie's wife, who was a devout Christian, could not sleep the night of the Titanic's voyage. She was at home thousands of miles away from the Atlantic tragedy in the North America, Atlantic. She was anxiously waiting her husband's arrival from Liverpool, England, on the Titanic. She was experiencing a strange sense of foreboding. She was resting, but sleep wouldn't come. And so she kept getting up and praying during the night. She rose from her bed and prayed for her husband. Little did she know that the Titanic carrying her husband had hit an iceberg and was going down. Little did she know that her husband had fallen overboard into the icy waters of the Atlantic and was struggling for his life at that very same moment. But she was praying. Never question when you when if you can't sleep, pray. And if you if if, if prayer if sleep is going to come, then you don't have to worry about praying. I just find praying when you can't sleep works. You either fall asleep or you keep praying. <laughs> uh, sometimes you go and you just 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 keep praying. When Mrs. Gracie prayed at home, a strange peace came over her, and she said, I knew my husband would be okay. What's he doing? He's in the Atlantic Ocean fighting for his life. She wrote, it was as if the arms of God encircled me, and I went back to bed and fell peacefully asleep. At that very hour, her husband, thousands of miles away in the cold Atlantic, was just about to sink beneath the icy waves when a lifeboat appeared out of nowhere. Desperately, he grasped the side of the boat. Strong arms pulled him into the aboard. The water was filled. The water was filled with men and women who let uh, the uh, men who let the women go first, so that there was room for them in the lifeboats. How did the lifeboat find Colonel Gracie in those icy waters? Why had there been just room for him? Mrs. Gracie knew why. She prayed for her husband, and God answered her prayer. Blessed is a man, a husband, whose wife prays for him. Blessed is a wife whose husband prays for her. Blessed are the children whose parents pray for them. <coughs> Blessed are the parents whose children pray for them. Death and darkness again tried to have its finest hour. In the life of Colonel, it was again defeated. Right from the time of rebellion and his being cast out of the heavens, Lucifer, <coughs> Satan, Morning Star, of, uh, of the, the, the morning star has represented now darkness, not the star anymore. And you know, it's interesting because the world is so twisted and warped. We have a program on TV, I have watched it, it's called Lucifer. You know, we have all the junk that you can ever possibly have. We're in trying times. I like saying, the Bible says, perilous times will come. Um, Perilous times are here. I don't know if you tried to come over the hill. Is it, is it block, not blocked anymore there? But on um, on uh, Friday afternoon evening there was a, a shootout and and that was blocked up on Niebuhr Hill for for a day and a half. And um, actually, a guy was driving along in his car. You can see it on YouTube. A guy was driving along in his car going down to toward Hepburn's way, just at the bottom of the hill there, and. Um, and he saw there was a, a roadblock, and um, and he stopped, and his, his camera was filming, and this truck came around this roadblock, streets around, in the ditch, around it, right past him, right down that, went the other way, well, they had police waiting down there, there was about 10, or 10 police cars you know, in the whole set situation. Gunshots were fired, 
when the guys were, drove by and he said, he said they had ski masks on and goggles. And uh, there they went. That's the day that we're living in. And so that was enough. The, if you live out by Lassieville yesterday, a couple of guys went in there with sawed off shotguns and robbed the, 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 the hotel. I mean, it is, we're in perilous days. And it's not the Lord, but it is the enemy, and, he's, and he is out. And we had the robbery here in Bentley. Uh, we've had two, one in the hotel, and I don't know why, um, how, why the robbers always go after the liquor stores, but, uh, but they've also been in a grocery store and in a drug store, and so we're in perilous times. We're in times of darkness. But the Bible says that people love darkness rather than light. Why? When their deeds are evil. If our deeds aren't evil, we don't mind light. We don't mind people questioning. We don't mind the light coming in. Christ came to be the light of the world. Satan, who was an angel, lost it, and now he's an angel of darkness. John 1 and 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing has, that was made has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. And that light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Go down to verse, part of verse, eight is, or verse 9, it says, The true light that gives light to every man was come into the, into the world. So we see that the light comes into the world. Darkness comes to take away the light. For those of you that have been around me for any time, I have some safe statements or sayings that I use quite often. Uh, one of them is, well, if you think you're important, Get yourself a five-gallon bucket of water and put your arm in right up to there. If you think the, the world can't go on without you, put your arm in right up to there and then quickly pull it out and look for the hole. That's how fast it fills. That's how fast it fills. And so uh, the other thing that I like to say is that uh, I've never seen darkness chase light. Light comes and where does darkness go? It skedaddles at the speed of light, 185,000 miles a second. Light, you open a box of darkness, and what do you get? Nothing. Light. You, know, you open a box with a light in it, what do you get? Light. God wants us to know that he's the light of the world. And we're in a world that's getting filled daily, deeper and deeper and deeper in darkness. And so uh, there's things that we need to do, like... like uh, this week in town, there's been a number of break-ins and, and um, hitting vehicles. They go down the block and check every door to see if the door is open. If it's open, they go in your car and take what they can get. Uh, one fellow said this week, um, it gets depressing reading this Bentley Crimes thing. Uh, but one fellow said this week that they um, stole his license plate. You see, they steal the license plate so that then when they steal a vehicle, they put your license plate on it, and the police are looking for a certain license plate, and they don't find it. So you can go to the county and get screws, bolts or screws, whatever, for putting your license plate on. That makes it almost impossible to get them off. They'll go to the next vehicle. And how often do you walk out to your car and say, oh yes, I have my license plate today. <laughs> Sometimes it can be days and weeks before you notice. Sometimes it's when the police pull you over and say, where's your license plate? On oh, the back. No thought. And so this is the day that people are doing that. But it wasn't just started here. So Matthew 27, 45. When Jesus was dying on the cross, it said, from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, Laba Shadidia, uh, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when some of these standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with vinegar wine and put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. They're killing the Son of God, the Son of Man. And they're wanting to watch and see this. Boy, this is something worth watching. And when Jesus cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, in verse 51, it says, the curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. 
They came out of the tombs, and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared unto many people. When the centurions, those who were guarding him, Jesus, saw the earthquake and all that happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely this was the Son of God. Satan felt, and he still feels it, that darkness is his, he's got the upper hand. People get afraid in, in darkness. I tell the story of my second church in Dauphin, Manitoba, where I, I'm just, just human, I'm just human, if you hadn't noticed, just a human being. Um, in my church, it was an older church, and uh, you go through the front door, and you go down the stairs, my office was at the one corner, but to get the lights on in the, in the, in the downstairs, you had to walk through three rooms into the kitchen and turn on the lights. And so, you know, how many of you ever been a little concerned about walking through dark rooms? Nowadays, you take out your phone, you punch in the, the, the app that gives you a light, and it leads you down the road. Someone said you got to watch out about that because some of those apps that you, look, that you load for flashlight also tie you into somebody else checking on you. So you just never know. But anyways, I would go down there and turn on the light, and that was okay. Um, you, know, you make it through once the lights on, go, whoosh, whoosh, lights on. Then you look around, everything's fine. But you see, darkness makes you want to think there's something might be there that shouldn't be there. But light, we don't worry about as much because you can see. If it was pitch dark in here, we might be stumbling and tripping, whatever. But you know, with all the lights, we can see what's going on here. And so, but the interesting thing was that when I was leaving the building, I, was, I wasn't very smart this week. I, I, I was just exercising my, my privilege to wear shorts and sandals and caught a cold. <laughs> so it wasn't very smart. So I, I went right from that to Long John's. <laughs> oh, I felt much warmer. Anyways, so I go down the I go down this hall and I, I through the two three rooms and I turn off the lights. And what do you think as I'm going back through those dark rooms the thoughts are? You might have been there. Is there something in the room? Something hiding in the room? I just walked through those rooms. <laughs> And then all of a sudden, darkness is going to tell me, watch out, he'll get you. What do we used to call it? The boogeyman. The boogeyman. I never met one. <laughs> but we called it that. Uh, uh, so anyways, I would go down there and I would feel good. So, so what did I do? I find that when darkness comes and we're discouraged and we're fearful or whatever, Martin, you talked about it, I found I would sing. And I would praise. He can't fear and praise at the same time. That's right. So we need to praise, choose to praise, then to fear. If we want to fear, we can fear, but we don't have to. And so I came, would come through there, and I thought, isn't that interesting how, how quickly that darkness tries to take control? Well, here, the, here it's darkness. Jesus is on the cross. Victory is now in sight for Satan. They wait five minutes. He waits ten minutes. He waits thirty minutes. He waits an hour, he waits two hours, two and a half. Oh, I, I'm telling you, Satan was thinking, we've got it made. We've got it made. Three hours now of darkness. Now Jesus is drained, dying, he cried out. The people said, leave him alone. He's calling Elijah. We might get to see Elijah. I mean, they're killing the Son of God, the Son of Man, and they're running why would they think of Elijah? Anybody know why they might think they would see Elijah? This is a test today, okay? But you, you, you can't fail. Why do you think they, they think he would see Elijah? Elijah went up alive. He will come back in the end times as one of the prophets. He never died. He went up in a chariot. And, and the flames, of, and, and he went into heaven. So they believed that Elijah was still alive. And he did come and talk to Jesus on the mountain. And so they go, well, let's see if we can see Elijah too. We might as well get everything going here today. And you know, we've walked through the valley of the shadow of death. Sometimes we're alone. People have watched. People mock. And that's what they're doing there. Mock. Uh, they visit. They laugh. They argue over things. Jesus is there all alone. And he asks the Father, why do I feel so all alone? Heaven is at brass. Pain, mourning, weeping. Strength is gone. No human way enough. 
We call this the beginning of the end of, of yourself. And where he came to that point in the spirit line, he was gone. The light came back. Hmm. It's interesting because darkness carries with it its finest hour. But I, I, I wanted to record it. I, was, I couldn't record it, but, uh, but that song, Hold On My Child, Joy Comes in the Morning, Weeping Only Endures to the Night, The Darkest Hour is Before the Dawn. The Darkest Hour. So don't be discouraged with what we're seeing today. I'm getting more excited. Not, well, sometimes not so excited. I'm getting more excited because I believe, and I've shared it for years, that we're coming into the brightest day, the brightest light, the brightest hour, the revelation of God saying, I'm here. Uh, people are silly, they don't look at it, and they think, well, you know, what is there left in Christianity? Oh, I'm not talking about religion, but I'm talking about our faith in God. If you have a prayer that you're praying for, don't give up on it. Don't give up on it. We might not see the answers. I said to my sister this week, you know, here I am, um, got this sciatic nerve that's giving me a terrible time, runs from my hip down to my foot, so I'm walking around and it's painful. I do stuff for it, and some of you have been there, so you know what I'm talking about. Some of you know more than I, than I do. And I'm thinking, I start talking to my sister, communicating with my sister, because my brother-in-law is 73 or 74, and they gave him two weeks to live, they gave him three months to live, now he's almost in the end of three months, and um, he's battling, they had to stop his heart and restart it this week to um, get it beating properly, uh, battling for his life, but they just believe that somehow God was going to touch him and heal them. But hold on, my child, joy comes in the morning. Weeping, Weeping is there. And I'm thinking to myself, am I crazy? Running from the air? Should I do this? Do I need this? I'm getting old, you know. Or some people think. But I'm healthy. But I'm healthy. But all I know is the Holy Spirit told me when I was standing in the monkey top saloon, He's there too sometimes, you know. I stand in my cup saloon as we're saying farewell to Darling Goring, passed away, someone who really spoke into my life, somebody that I honored. And she done so much for this community. She was on council and she did so much and not always well appreciated. Um, but I was standing there and I just said, you know, in honor of Darling, I am choosing to run for the mayor of this town. And uh, some people cheered and other people said, I had no business saying it. <laughs> Anyways, that isn't my problem. I'm thinking these thoughts, oh, my pain, oh, what, what am I up to? You know, like, uh, and then I hear things people want to say or whatever, everybody's got an idea. And I think, do I need this? Um, well, I've got a, I've got a, a, a trump card, and it's not Donald. <laughs> I've got a trump card. Tomorrow night when they count the ballots, if God doesn't want me in there, guess what? Don't be heartbroken. Because <laughs> I won't be in there and I'll support Linda. If he wants me in there, I'll be in there. I, I don't have a worry in the world about that. I know I'm just supposed to. And even if it's just to go out and meet all these neat people in town, that's worth it. Because I, I just don't go out and go door to door. I tell them I'm not here preaching. And I don't come from, well, I don't tell them what church it might be, <laughs> where they carry a little bag. <laughs> but but I, I met some wonderful people, and I needed to know all these new people that are living in our town. And the, the, the hope that I have for our community, the future that God has promised us. And so either way, I don't have to worry because it's in God's hands. And just pray that his will will be done. But when we go back to what the Word of God says, in John 17, it says one of the most significant ch chapters of the Bible, it records Jesus' most comprehensive prayer for his people. In this chapter, we listen to Jesus' earnest longing for his children to be saved. Jesus focused his attention in prayer on us. Before he even laid Pilate's judgment on the Roman scourging, Golgotha's hill. Before him lay the, the, the cruel nails which we pierced his flesh. Before him awaited the crown of thorns, that would be jammed on his head, the spear that would wound his side. Before him was the mockery of the mob, an illegal trial, rejection of his own people, an abandonment and betrayal from his friends. 
Wow, if you faced all that, what would you be praying for? Lord, help me, Jesus. I wasted and sold. Help me. How can I get out of this? Lord, get me out of this. Father, help me. Pray, Lord, please don't let this come. I don't deserve this. That's the whole point. Jesus didn't deserve it. That's why he was able to give it. Who deserved the death? We did. Man was lost in sin. Jesus didn't deserve to die. He lived the life that we can't live, a perfect life, a sinless life, and so he, he was able to give his life. So he wasn't praying, you know, I don't like those pilot, I don't like that, and I don't like this, and I really don't like getting scourged. And I really don't like when my head gets crunched and blood is coming down with a crown of thorns. And you know, you know, God, hey, Father, don't we own this world? Maybe you could pull a little rank here. But you know, the Bible tells us that he was praying for us. He knew it was coming, but he was praying for us. He looked beyond Pilate's judgment, but beyond Calvary, and he thought of you, thought of me. His prayer is speaking for you and I about the greatest love in the universe. In verse 1 it says, And these words spake Jesus, of John 17, lifted up his eyes into heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son may also glorify thee. Wow, what kind of a glorifying? He is about to be beaten, persecuted, and, and killed. Father, the hour is come. The hour in which millions throughout time have looked forward to and backward to has come. The hour that the searchlight of history has looked and has it, for it has come. The hour that the prophets of old had proclaimed. Father, the hour has come. The hour of my death on the cross. The hour when the controversy between good and evil will be finally and fully settled as the Son of God delivers his life as the sacrifice on Calvary's cross. Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son. Thy Son may also glorify thee. The hour of the Savior's greatest agony was the hour of the greatest glory. The hour of his death was the hour of his glorification. Jesus marched to death not as a de defeated soldier, but as a conquering general. The hour of Christ's death was the clearest demonstration in the universe of the Father's love. Jesus revealed his matchless love on the cross. Never again would there be any justification for the doubting that love. Never again would the human race have any possible reason to misunderstand that love. Oh, we do. We do mess it up. You know, people say, well, if God loves us, how come, how come there's storms? If you looked in your bulletin today, all that stuff is happening in, 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 in uh, California. It's unbelievable. Well, if God is love, how come that happens? Well, they're still looking at, at, at many of these fires. They're looking at who started them. Um, well, if it's lightning, it's God. Not... Uh, but you see, we want to blame God. But, but you know, we got to quit looking at it. Just realize that when we go through these things, they, what's a PGA? I'm not much of a golfer. Who's a good golfer here? They had the PGA. Oh, Larry, it was the PGA tournament, the uh, big one in, in California. Yeah. And they, had, they just had it a week or so ago. And right beside the, the golf course is multi million dollar houses that are now burned to the ground. And people are saying, you can, repair, you can restore things, you can get things again. Forty people have died already of these fires, and many are, 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 are missing. They're looking for them. It's terrible. And you see that, wow, what are we facing? But you know, God comes to love. And so we see lessons, and we see stories, we always hear stories of how people are rescued. There was a couple, I forget how old they were. I, you know, like, there's so much information out there, it's hard to re remember it all. I remember what was it um, was it um, for Henry Ford was was, uh, was being uh, charged for being ignorant, and he brought them to court and he said he just didn't know he, he wasn't smart something well it's a way to get money okay and he brought him to court and they said do you know this president do you know that president do you know this do you know that and um, and finally he just said and he was failing and finally he said hold on I don't have enough time to store all that information in my brain. But you give me five minutes, I'll find something that has the answer and I'll get it, bring it back to you. And I feel like that sometimes, you can't store it all, but here's this couple, survived this horrible fire in their house, in their swimming pool. 
And how many couples stayed in the swimming pool and they lived through it? Think, wow, wow. That's what people are going through. And, you know, it's sad because we, we if someone doesn't speed up fast enough on the highway, we have, we're, we slow down a bit, we can get ticked, frustrated. You know, is that really good? And what the worst thing about being ticked when someone's so slow in front of you is when you get to the next town and you get stopped at the red light and they pull up beside you, the nerve of them. They're sitting here at the same time beside you. And you think, after all my frustration, and there they are, oh, hi. <laughs> you, you gave, went by them and you weren't saying hi. <laughs> you almost ran them off the road. But, but you know, but this is North America, things we go through. Other people are going through terrible times. We need to be moved by compassion with what they're going through. Um, and realize that there are people facing unbelievable things in the world. It hasn't stopped in the States. One after another, after another, after another, after another. Uh, now it's the fires in California. We have relatives over there. Uh, and, and you see the picture of where all the fires are in the bulletin. It's unbelievable. We're told that um, there's a fascinating painting in the Washington Art, Art Gallery. In a moving World, T to World uh, War II scene, the artist depicts a battlefield with two groups of tanks moving toward one another. Two divisions, the Allied forces are attacking the Nazi forces. The tanks are firing their guns. The ground tubes are in, in full battle. One lone soldier is in the center of the picture, captures your attention. Two groups of Allied soldiers have been cut off from the others. An enemy bullet has pierced their communication line. And in the midst of heavy gunfire, one lone soldier is responsible for repairing the severed phone lines. And that's what the picture is. He's in there. His hands are outstretched over his head in the picture as the works on the wire. And just as he completes the job, a bullet rips through his uniform, his chest is splattered with blood. The artist has chosen one word to describe his painting. The word that describes the scene is done. Done. He got the communication back. The message of the picture is obvious. One soldier gave his life. His blood splattered uniform indicates that message got through. Communication is really reestablished. Do you know, friends, today, sometimes we have to go through pain. God doesn't say, okay, I'm just going to give you all the pain you have. There's somebody else that likes to give it away. Sometimes we have to go through loss. Sometimes we have to go through things where we don't understand that the eyes of our heart would be open. And we'll see. We begin to care, care for other people that are going through things. We begin to reach out. And, you know, it's, it's always important uh, to worry about ourselves. But the message got through. Satan is a liar. God is love. Divine love would go to any length to save the human race. The prayer of Jesus that, might, that I recorded in John 17 is saturated with love. Calvary's mountain echoes love through the valley of the earth. Jesus looked beyond Pilate's judgment hall, beyond Gethsemane, beyond the farce of the trial, beyond the Calvary's mountain, and he looked ahead to the trials and tribulations, temptations and sufferings and sorrow, and the disappointments and discouragements his followers would face through the centuries. And he was going home, but his followers were still happy in the world. And Jesus made three specific requests for us that night. John, uh, verse 11, Holy Father, keep through uh, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that uh, they may be one as we are one. Jesus was thinking about us and about unity. He wasn't thinking about the crown of thorns and nails, the spears of the night. He was thinking about you and I. And he was not thinking about himself. He was thinking about his church, that people would be one. Where would our thoughts be? Where, would, where are they? And, and it said in verse 21, and, and as we look at the verse, that they may be one. As thou, O Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they may also be one in us, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me. It's time. It's time for the body of Christ to start getting along. It's time where we have to have compassion for one another, where our heart is broken for a church that's going through a tough time, that we rally alongside and say, how can we help you? What can we do to help you? Not to say, Oh, that's too bad. I'm glad it's not happened to me. <laughs> you know, you ever, you ever had that feeling? Oh, I, I, I feel sorry for you. And inside you think, but I'm glad it's not happening to me. He prayed for unity in the church. He prayed for oneness. He prayed for harmony. 
He was going to leave his followers. He was leaving a small band of disciples with a variety of temperaments, which with different dispositions and attitudes. And he thought of Peter, who was so outspoken, of Matthew, who was so exacting, of Thomas, who was so doubting. And they're all different. He's going that we may be one. Philip was an introvert and reflective, and John was a fiery temper. And Jesus thought of these men with such different backgrounds and dispositions. And he thought of a church of all ages and, and prayed, Father, that their different backgrounds, that they different dispositions, that their device ways of looking at things, Father, keep them as one. Do you know, I grew up in a, a Pentecostal church in Nicasa. And I remember as a little boy, because we were called the Holy Rollers. I never did roll. I never did see anybody swinging. Uh, but we were called the Holy Rollers, and, and we were picked on and mocked and all that. But you know, um, I grew up in that church, but, but I had an attitude. And I had an attitude that Anglicans have, that Mormons have, that Catholics have, that Pentecostals have, that Baptists have. But it came as a little child growing up. And I looked at my friends with the United Church, and I, I thought, Lord, how was it possible that I got born into the only family that was going to the right church? <laughs> and all my friends, they don't have a hope, because they weren't born into a family that went to the Pentecostal church. But you see how we can get warped? And then I find some of the Baptists, the Catholics, and Mennonite, whatever, so all, that we're all one in Christ. We might have different things that we like or, or dislike. We might disagree or, or agree or argue. But there's coming a time when we need to quit arguing. So that when the world looks at us, they'll say, wow, they're walking in unity. They're walking, and that was Jesus' prayer. The most convincing evidence that Jesus came into the world is in the love and unity. Among his followers of very backgrounds. The greatest testimonies of the power of the gospel is not fine church buildings or magnificent magnificent institutions, great performances, award-winning acts, and mostly charged praise and worship. I remember years ago, a friend uh, was one of our leaders, and he wrote an article about how the Pentecostal church really moved uptown. And he said, you know, we used to be across the tracks, and we had little shabby buildings, and our music was music. Um, it was uh, what we had. And I remember my mom saying, my dad played and sang, my mom played piano and sang, and I remember when they'd get up and sing, I'm going, it, it was, it just tore me apart, because I was afraid they might make a mistake, and then I'd be embarrassed. <laughs> That's what we think as children. He said, when we're children, we think like children, we act like children, we're not going to stay there any longer. So anyways, we, we, we see these things, and, and we think that we're right, because it's just what we learn. Uh, my favorite example, and you're probably getting bored of it, is a couple that got married, and this is so significant to us. This couple got married, and one day he came home from work, and she would made this sausage in a pan. And he thought it was really good. And he said, how do you cook? And she told him, and we said, so, he said, wow, I noticed that you cut the ends off before you cooked it. Yeah, yeah. you do that, why? Because my mom did. So I thought, well, I'm going to ask mom. And she just did it because that's what you do. So I told her mom, I said, mom, that was good sausage, but I noticed that my wife cut the ends off, and she said, you do it. Why did you do it? She says, well, that's where the men's fingers touch it. <laughs> <laughs> and I cut the ends off. And um, so I went to grandma, and my mom did it. Anyways, it followed down to grandma, and she said, why did you cut the ends off? She says, Mercy sakes alive, it was the only way it would fit my pan. <laughs> so generations were doing it and knew it was the only way to go. And you know, I got in a lot of trouble like that. But we won't tell. But um, I came out of a cooking background. I cooked for the Bayshire Inn and trained in cooking and all that. And so when we first got married, Janet's mom was a wonderful cook and, and Janet was learning to cook and I just stayed out of the kitchen. And then after a while, I was offering her wisdom on how to cook. 
and she could probably tell it better. I was offering her, well, this is the way, and this is the way. Anyways, and, and she was listening. It was good. She was listening until we went to visit my mom. She watched my mom cook, and she said, you're just telling me where your mom did it. <laughs> and we do that. In Christianity, we do that. It's the way. We do that. We think it's... Uh, it's not the fantastic things that we do. It's not the fantastic prophet, prophetic word, people laying all over the floor, whatever it is. The world knows how to construct marvelous edifices and temples, and the world can put on a show probably better than we can. The world can give us an emotional ecstasy. But the most convincing evidence that Jesus Christ has come into the world is to be seen in the transformation of character in the lives of people. Jesus prayed for oneness among his followers. He prayed that husbands and wives should be one. He prayed that there would be sweet, loving spirit in our homes, in our churches. He prayed that parents would be one with their children. He prayed that children would be one with their parents. And that they may all be one as he, as he was with his father. And he said that the world may know that thou hast sent me. I stand on my, on my what I have in my heart. I believe the darker it gets, the closer we are to the light. The darker it gets, and it's getting dark. I mean, I mean, for a day and a half, you couldn't go past that corner. Everybody was redirected because of darkness. Because of darkness. Darker it gets, the closer we are to the light. Let's not get discouraged and say, oh no, oh no, the light will never come. I believe that the light is coming. And one of my other lines that I use is, um, I don't believe God's going to sneak us away in the middle of the night because he can't win. So I better get them out of there. They're in trouble now. I better get them out of there. They'll never make it. I believe that God is going to let us see God. Not me. Not you. Not great and wonderful things. Um, we're going to see God. And I believe that's what we're coming to. And I want to be encouraged in that. I want you to be encouraged in that. If God and your children. God and your grandchildren. God in your work, God in your, in whatever it is, your neighbors. You know, there are neighbors that have never talked for years because they're mad. Can't remember why they're mad. They're not talking. That's not an example. If we're Christians, we need to go beyond. Go beyond people's faults and see their needs. Reach out and touch them. Reach out and bless them. Jesus didn't say that you should unite with, with error. He didn't tell the disciples to go and join the scribes and Pharisees. Unity in apostasy, apostasy should not, never be desired or sought after. What, what, what do we think about that? But among those who keep the commandments of God and have testimony of Jesus Christ, there ought to be unity. He went on to say, and when I am prone to push my own way and to allow my ego and my pride to selfishly assert my own opinions, when I rise up in anger to get my own way when I'm ready to fight to prove my point, when I'm tempted to, by the accuser of the brethren to gossip and to criticize unjustly or cut down someone with my tongue, he said at that point we need to go back and allow ourselves to be one. Remember, remember that he wants us to be one. Remember the night when, uh, the night when Jesus was on his knees praying that this church would be one and that there should be love and unity and real Christian concern for one another. Brothers holding the hand of brothers, sisters holding the hands of sisters. He prayed that others would find the truth through the love and the unity of people. And when he said, Father, that they may be one, he knew there was an argument amongst them who would be the greatest, who would be the, the best. There was greed and outright robbery with Judas. And James and John, the sons of the thunder, wanted to. Uh, to fight over the best seats in heaven. And he was going to the cross, and they didn't understand. They wanted to make sure that their seat was ready for them. Can I get a one? Can I be on the other? And Jesus says, it's not for you to do. Jesus I pray not for those alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Do you believe in the Lord? Yeah. Guess what? He prayed for every one of us here today, that we might be mine. God's going to give you opportunity. And sometimes it means biting your lip. Sometimes it means not giving the wisdom and the brilliance that you know. Sometimes it means just uh, waiting a little while longer, checking it out, 
And I, have you ever been embarrassed when you found out something wasn't true? And you were so sure, and you told a few people about it. Little Johnny, I'm going to close with this. Little Johnny was going to, I won't use John, I'll use another name, I'll use Peter. Uh, it was, uh, they were having a Sunday school picnic, and little Pete, uh, any Peters? Oh, and it was little Pete, little Pete was, uh, he never got invited to this picnic. And it was just a misunderstanding. And so finally, um, someone said, oh, Pete, oh, Pete, you, you, you're not going to the picnic? He said, I wasn't invited. Oh, Pete, you're invited. And he started to cry. I said, Pete, you're invited. Why are you crying? He said, I already prayed it would rain. <laughs> you see, we don't get it right. The person came in the room, and two people were talking. And as soon as they came in the room, have you ever been there? And they got, oh, and they looked guilty. They're talking about me. <laughs> Happened a couple times. Then you start saying, you know, they're talking about me, and I, that's not fair, and, and I'm upset, and I'm mad, and ticked off, and everything. And uh, they were talking about me. And they did get quiet. That's, I remember my wife, when she planned my 50th birthday, I'd go out to drive the bus, and she'd be on the phone phoning people. They surprised me. She'd be on the phone phoning people, and then she had to erase everything. So I couldn't find out, because I'm a snoop. <laughs> and uh, one time I walked back in, and she jumped back into bed and pretended she was still in bed. <laughs> so they were talking about this person, and then one day they walked in the room and they said, surprise! It was a birthday party. And then how do you feel? You're ticked off, angry, say nasty things, and they were talking about you, but it was something good. We don't know. But God just said, let's be one. Let's be one, one in, in Christ. You can't do it in your own strength, but we can do it in the strength of the Lord. Where we care about one another, we bless one another, we encourage one another, we welcome one another, we uh, reach out and touch one another. You see somebody going through something, you help one another. Jesus said many things. I was naked, you clothed me. I was hungry, you fed me. I was a stranger, you took me in. I was in prison, you visited me. You know, all these things. He said, we never saw you. He said, when you've done to the least of these, you've done it to me. So let's realize what darkest Darkness's finest hour is just before its final hour. Light comes, joy comes in the morning. We being nervous the night, but joy comes in the morning. I believe, no matter what I've been facing, I believe that joy is coming. I'm praying for my brother-in-law. What I what, what I need to tell you is that the other night he was he had a, he had a, it wasn't a dream or something. wasn't sure what it was. A friend of his came in the room. And he said, it's time to be healed in the name of Jesus. There's a song, Rise and Be Healed in the Name of Jesus. And he was inspired by it, and, and so his friend left. And um, he went and got some coffee, picked up a book that his mother had uh, given him, and it said the same thing, time to be healed in the name of Jesus. He was feeling encouraged, had another coffee. And I don't even know how it all happened, but, but then he decided, well, I'm feeling encouraged when they've given him no time to live. And uh, they had to restart his heart to get a beating right. And all the things he's going through, he's got these picks and he's getting fluids and everything uh, that are going to his body to keep him alive. He phoned his friend and he said, were you just in my room? He said, no. But he said, we just called for a group to come and we were praying for you. And God gave him a vision of him in the room. I believe we're going to see things that we've never seen before. And I believe, well, back in the early times, there were folks growing up in their ministry and, and serving the Lord. They saw more miracles because we had less, less things that we could do. The, the less we had, the more we had to trust God. And we prayed. Nowadays, uh, we, we do whatever we can to protect ourselves. Then we pray. And so what I'm saying is that I believe that we're going to see these things. And so we're praying. And I want to pray in closing this morning for my brother-in-law, Phil. Father, we just thank you. No matter how dark the darkness looks, as Joe and Phil and their family are there, Lord, it looks so impossible. Like there's nothing can be done for them health-wise, and they're doing everything they can. But Lord, you said to rise and be healed in the name of Jesus. And so we stand with him today, that healing. Lord, he needs something to happen with a molar tooth that's affecting him. And Lord, that you can just reach down and touch that tooth. Lord, it's affecting everything. 
And so, Lord, I just pray that today there could be healing in that too. That it would just subside it and it wouldn't add to all the things that he's going through. And so we just lift him, fill up today in prayers out of the coast. Lord, let your presence and your peace and your power, your provision, your healing power be in that room and in his body and in their family. We just agree. Lord, you said that we would be one. Not, um, and part of that is to bearing one another's burdens and, and, and so fulfill the love of Christ. So we do. We carry my brother Juan today in prayer. And Lord, I think of, of Jay, and he's battling the same thing. A young man, 32 years old. Lord, we pray as he's been going through the, the treatments and, and uh, the bone marrow transplant, all these things. Lord, that you will also be there to touch him and bring healing. And for all the people that we know today that are battling sicknesses, whether it be spiritual, physical, whether it be battles with temptations and things in the world. Lord, we pray that um, we might be able to lift them up in prayer, that God, you can touch them and bring healing, bring hope. Lord, let this be a day of hope, we ask it. Now, in Jesus' name, and we will give you the praise for all that you are doing, in the name of the Lord. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Good night.